So you've done everything right for that next batch of beer. You've absorbed the common wisdom, you've highlighted the forum posts and read every brewing book you can get your hands on. You follow your recipe at every step, you hit every number and yet beer just tastes okay. Your beer might be good, maybe even really good, but it doesn't have that professional polish, that sparky taste at your favorite brewery. You're wondering what you're doing wrong. But the answer isn't about what you're not doing, it's about the rules that you need to unlearn. See, the truth is, much of conventional brewing wisdom is filled with outdated advice, oversimplifications and rigid rules that are holding your beer back. But what if that common advice you're being told is wrong? In this episode of Quality Focus Pro Brewers, we're not just bending the rules, we're tearing up the pages. This isn't about a new set of rules, it's about understanding the why behind the process so you can start making decisions like a real brewer, not just someone following a recipe. So get ready to cross some things out of your rule book because here's the five brewing rules you need to unlearn. Let's get brewing. G'day brewers, my name is Hendo and I'm a pro brewer coach from the Rockstar Brewer Academy. I help home brewers and pro brewers from all over the world implement quality systems they need so they can brew amazing world-class beer. Let's start with the foundation of nearly every all-grain brew day. The 60-minute mash followed by the 60-minute boil. It's written in every book, but what if half of that time is often unnecessary? Thanks to the incredible work of modern maltsters, the malts we use today are so well modified that the starches can actually be fully converted into fermentable sugars in as little as 15 minutes. And if you want proof, just go and check the certificate of analysis of your favourite malt. In it, you'll see that there's an analysis called conversion time. For most modern malt, this can be as little as 8 to 12 minutes. This just because thinking also extends to the boil, especially with the old rule of mandatory 60 minute boils for beers with Pilsner malt. The reason given is all about a compound called SMM. SMM is in lighter malts, and when you heat it up, it creates dimethyl sulfide or DMS, that unpleasant cooked corn or cooked cabbage flavour you get in certain pale beers. The theory was that you needed a long, hard boil to drive it all off. And while this is certainly true, there's two better ways to keep the DMS out of your beer, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But here's the thing. That advice is incredibly outdated. Today, the malting process is so advanced that modern Pilsner malts have way less SMM precursor than they did decades ago. For almost every brewer, a standard 60 minute boil is plenty to handle any potential DMS. So what's the modern approach? It's a new mindset. Mash a little hotter and a little shorter until conversion is done. Maybe do an iodine starch test and boil for a reason, not just for a rule. With today's modern malt, conversion is often complete within 30 minutes, but even then, 45 minutes is pretty fair, just to be safe if you're feeling it. And on a double brew day, you've just saved yourself up to an hour. When it comes to the boil, getting your wort pH right at the start of the boil and getting it to about 5.4 is more effective at removing DMS than a 90 minute boil ever would. Now, it's not appropriate for some styles and that's for sure, but as an 80-20 rule, you can get away with a solid rolling 30 minute boil, especially if you're brewing a modern style like a beer that has no bittering addition and just whirlpool hops, say something like a Nipa or an XPA. As long as you're boiling long enough to sterilize the wort, you're good to go. Now your mileage might vary depending upon your ingredient choice and brew day parameters, and that's okay. Just make sure your kettle isn't totally covered, which can trap DMS inside the kettle. So when would you boil longer? You might go a 90 minute boil for a high gravity beer like a barley wine for instance, where you need to get some Maillard reaction so you can develop rich melanoidin flavours. Or maybe you're brewing an imperial stout or a scotch ale or a bock. But in this case, a longer boil is mainly about flavour, not out of some misplaced fear of cream corn or a blind devotion to the clock. That extra time's a tool, not a requirement. Hey, next up, I'm going to debunk the myth about sparge temperature. But in the meantime, could you please check that you're subscribed to the channel? Because I checked the analytics last week and a surprising 60% of you who are watching this aren't actually subscribed. Subscribing is free and it ensures you don't miss another video when I release it. So next up is the rigid rule about your sparge water temperature and that it has to be exactly 170 degrees Fahrenheit or 77 degrees Celsius. 
The books warn you that if you go any higher, you'll pull dreaded tannins and polyphenols from the grain husks, leaving your beer with a gross, astringent tea-like bitterness, and you'll wind up with some chill haze. This fear has brewers nervously staring at their thermometers, terrified of overshooting the mark by even a single degree. This is a classic case of blaming the wrong culprit. Yes, high temperatures can help extract tannins, but the temperature isn't the main driver. The real villain here is pH. Tannins become much more soluble once the pH of your grain bed and your runnings creeps up past 6, or your runnings gravity drops below 3 Plato or 1012 SG. Throughout the mash, the grains themselves keep the pH in a safe zone. You know, you're probably aiming for something like 5.2 to 5.6. The real danger is at the very end of the lauder and sparge when you've rinsed away most of the sugars and the running's pH starts to climb. I mean, think about it. Here's why temperature is not really an issue. Some brewers do a decoction mash where they remove some of the mash and they literally boil it as part of their mash program without creating an astringent mess or chill haze. The pH is low and stable enough to prevent it. Understanding this frees you from the 170 degree Fahrenheit straight jacket. In fact, many brewers sparge with water that's 190 Fahrenheit or above because they're managing their pH and they're not over sparging. So what should you do? Well, inside the ProGrade Brewing Method course for home brewers and inside Beer Quality Bootcamp for the pros, brewers implement a tool called the Lauder Cheat Sheet, which they use on brew day. It stops you obsessing over temperature and gets you paying attention to your pH because a decent pH meter is a much better tool for preventing tannin and polyphenol extraction than a super accurate thermometer. The key is to just stop collecting your runnings when the gravity gets too low or the pH starts to rise too high. The 170 degree Fahrenheit rule was a decent safeguard back when nobody was checking their pH. The modern way is to monitor your pH at every step of the way on brew day and let that be your guide. As long as your running's pH stays below six, 5.8 if you're feeling a little bit extra cautious, you've got a ton of flexibility. So let's talk about our workhorse in the brewery, yeast. Specifically, the incredibly common practice of using a fresh pack of dry yeast for every single batch and then dumping the entire yeast cake out and down the drain after fermentation. Sure, it's simple, it's convenient, it's safe, and it's driven by a deep-seated fear of cross-contamination. But the problem? It's also incredibly expensive. Let's look at the numbers. Based on current dry yeast prices, if you single-pitch dry yeast every time you brew, your cost will be around $17 to $20 for a 50-litre or half-barrel keg of beer. That adds up really fast. Now, what if you simply harvested and repitched that yeast? If you repitch for just four cycles, now I'm like Charlie Bamforth, I don't use the word generations, I use the word cycles, your yeast cost per keg dramatically decreases to just 50 cents. So we're going down from $20 per keg to 50 cents per keg. Think about it. If you're running a commercial brewery and you're producing just 100,000 litres of beer or 1,000 barrels of beer per year, that's a massive $16,000 in cost savings directly onto your bottom line. You go from spending big money to spending pocket change. And that's why so many of the members of the Rockstar Brewer Academy love the Practical Craft Brewery Yeast Husbandry modules. So why isn't every brewery doing this? The myth is that to safely repitch yeast, you need an expensive micro lab, complete with petri dishes, incubators, and HEPA filtration in a special room. That fear is stopping brewers from saving huge amounts of money. For pro brewers inside the Rockstar Brewer Academy, we've got an entire course track dedicated to yeast husbandry, because the reality is you don't need a full micro lab to get started with yeast repitching. The barrier to entry is much lower than you'd think, and all you truly need is good plant sanitation, a microscope, a hemocytometer to count your yeast cells so you can do cell counts and check for viability. That's it. That's the starting point. And pro brewers inside the Rockstar Brewer Academy implement this in just six weeks and they start reaping their rewards of cost savings almost immediately. You can add more lab equipment later if you want to get more advanced, but it shouldn't stop you from just starting and saving the big bucks right now. Unlearn the fear of handling your yeast. Stop dumping money down the drain with every batch and start treating your yeast as a reusable asset, not as some disposable ingredient that's some powder that you throw in the top of the fermentation vessel at the end of brew day. Next, let's tackle one of the biggest time sinks in brewing, 
the fallacy that all lagers need to be fermented cold. The old rule says you must keep your lager at a chilly 8 to 10 degrees Celsius or 46 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit for weeks and weeks on end to get that signature clean, crisp profile. This turns many brewers off from having a lager in their core range in the first place and just sticking to ale ferments. This rule is born from a genuine fear of the fruity esters and off flavours that many traditional lager yeast produce if they get too warm. But here's the thing, you can ferment your lager at much warmer temperatures than you think. The most popular lager yeast strain on the planet, 3470, can be a total game changer if you run it right. This workhorse is incredibly clean and it doesn't need to be kept that cold. According to Fermentus, this yeast produces a natural fermentation character even at higher temperatures. In fact, I've been told that it can safely produce a clean, beautiful lager at temperatures of up to 20 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's even without pressure fermentation. So what does this mean for your brewery? It means you can make a clean lager fast. A great sweet spot that works well for me is fermenting at around 15 degrees Celsius or around 59 Fahrenheit. At this temperature, you get a beautiful clean fermentation without off flavors, and it finishes in a fraction of the time the traditional cold ferment would. I even increase the temperature to 17 degrees or 63 Fahrenheit for the diacetyl rest. You're no longer just preventing flaws, you're being efficient. So you need to unlearn the idea that lagers have to tie up your fermentation vessels for months on end. With the right yeast and the right water profile, you can smash out a clean lager with great crisp character in less than 21 days. You just have to be willing to turn up the heat a little. And lagers are usually the biggest selling beer in a brewery's core range lineup. And when you couple this with sound yeast husbandry where you repitch a yeast, you'll create an efficient brewery that reduces production costs and maximizes profit. Now the next rule is about the illusion of bitterness and calculating IBUs when you're putting together a beer recipe. For decades, when it comes to writing a beer recipe and hopping a beer, we've been obsessed with one number, IBUs, or International Bitterness Units. Books and software treat it as the final word on bitterness. Want a more bitter beer? Add more IBUs, making an IPA, oh, you got to hit 60 IBUs at least. This led to an IBU arms race, with brewers chasing bigger numbers thinking that this was the only way. See, the problem is, is that IBU is a lab measurement, not a taste measurement. It measures the concentration of isomerized alpha acids in the beer, and that's it. It tells you nothing about the perceived bitterness, how the beer actually tastes. How bitter a beer seems is a complex dance between dozens of factors. You've got to strike a balance between bitterness and sweetness. A big imperial stout with 50 IBUs, for instance, might taste less bitter than a crisp pilsner with only 35 IBUs, because all the residual sugar in the stout is balancing out the hops. On top of that, your water profile numbers make a huge difference. Increasing the sulfate to chloride ratio in your water makes bitterness seem sharp and crisp. Get it too high though, and the bitterness can seem astringent or harsh. More chloride softens out your bitterness and lets the malt shine. Your yeast strain, carbonation level, and even hop timing all change how you perceive bitterness. And with modern IPAs such as hazy IPAs and Nipahs, we know that massive dry hop additions can add hop burn or polyphenol bite that has nothing to do with IBUs at all, because hop burn is just hop flex in your finished beer. It's like eating hop pellets, and you wouldn't do that, would you? Would you? So it's time to unlearn the IBU obsession. Stop chasing a number in your recipe and start thinking about the quality and character of the bitterness that you want. Do you want the soft bitterness of a New England IPA? Cool, then focus on the higher chloride in your water profile and move your hops later into the boil, maybe cool your whirlpool down and increase your dry hop. Want the sharp, clean bite of a West Coast IPA? then a good 60 minute hop charge for bittering and putting some more sulfate in your water profile is your friend. And when it comes to lake kettle and whirlpool hop additions, stop relying on beer smith, brew father or brewer's friend to give you an accurate IBU prediction. The formulae that they use are a good indicator, no doubt, but they don't actually reflect the actual flavor outcome. For hop additions that are less than 15 minutes to go in the boil or in the whirlpool, Inside the Rockstar Brewer Academy, when we write a product specification, we use grams per litre or pounds per barrel as a ratio 
to define hop intensity instead of an IBU contribution from each hop charge. The IBU is a useful data point, sure, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. Mastering bitterness comes from learning to pull all these different levers to create a beer that's perfectly balanced. The most important tool in your brewery is your brain. Your goal should be to move beyond just following recipes and to start understanding the principles. When you start making decisions based on why things work, you're no longer just a recipe follower, you're a brewer, and that's when you'll start making truly unforgettable beer. Hey, if you like this episode, you're going to absolutely love this video, which I think you should check out next. Thanks heaps for watching this episode of Quality Focus Pro Brewers, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.